Uh, it, is, it is my honor and privilege to be able to introduce our next speaker. Uh, she and her husband are very good friends of mine and neighbors, uh, literally a stone's throw away uh, from my house. I, I haven't tried it yet. I haven't thrown a stone. It seems like an unneighborly thing to do. Probably a better way to, to measure distance than that. Uh, but it's, it's wonderful uh, to have her here joining us for this conference, talking on a subject that, that fits so well with our theme this weekend. In uh, 1852, Saint Cardinal uh, John Henry Newman gave a sermon. And in that sermon, he described the way the life of the church works in very Chestertonian terms, even though this is before Chesterton. Uh, he talks about how the church is always dying and coming back to life, uh, how there's darkness and then always the sunrise, very much the way that Chesterton, as, as we were reminded by Bishop Barron last night, very much the way Chesterton talks about the world St. Francis found, right? Uh, those dark ages, and then here comes the tumbler of God, uh, St. Francis, onto the scene. Uh, and in that homily, uh, St. John Newman talks about a coming second spring for the church, particularly in England, uh, that the church, he said, the church that was in England and had gone away from England is now returning in, Eng in England. And that's what God does for us. Uh, in every age, God raises up figures, heroic figures, to lead the church uh, and to renew it, especially when it is most in dire need of that renewal. And St. Francis of Assisi is one of those figures. Though he was too humble to claim it, John Henry Cardinal Newman was one of those figures. G.K. Chesterton was certainly one of those figures. Uh, and one of those figures was Stratford Caldecott. Uh, Tessa's father, and his work uh, with Second Spring and his work in calling for that renewal, uh, that intellectual and faith renewal that the church so desperately needed in England, uh, that work is now being carried on by Tessa, and so it is my absolute honor to bring her up here to speak about uh, this great man and our man G.K. Chesterton and St. Francis of Assisi, Tessa Caldecott. If you would kindly now put on your headsets, you will be able to hear this session translated into American. <laughs> I stand before you at this legendary conference for two reasons, who my father is and my accent. It's a good combination. My accent obliges you to take me seriously. My father, however, taught me that if a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing badly. So, win-win. Some of you knew him very well, some of you didn't know him at all, but you shall all know him better hereafter. Two English intellectuals and an Italian friar walk into a pub. <laughs> I should end there, that's the funny bit. <clears throat> the first rotund Englishman turns to the second less rotund Englishman and says, I say, old chap, I want to buy you a pint, but I seem to have forgotten my wallet. The second Englishman hunts through his pockets and shrugs. Oh dear, I can't find mine either. They turn expectantly to the ragged Italian. Non gradimi, he replies, vow of poverty, remember? I like to imagine my father, Stratford Caldecott, in a heavenly pub, carousing with his dear friends, Gilbert and Francesco. Tolkien is there too, of course, wreathed in smoke rings like Gandalf and probably quietly paying the tab. <laughs> Three fools for Christ, from such different eras and circumstances coming together. Oh, to be a fly on the wall. Don't get me wrong, my father was no fool in the sense of being a foolish man. As any Chestertonian, Franciscan, or even Shakespeare's scholar knows, 
The jester is generally the wisest man in the, in the room. We will come back to that later. But first, let me introduce Strat. I have to confess, I am a little daunted by the challenge of summing him up. But I am holding on to Chesterton's words when undertaking the same exercise with his beloved St. Francis. Though I am certain of failure, I am not altogether overcome by fear, for he suffered fools gladly. Born to agnostic South African parents in London in 1953, Stratford studied at Hartford College, Oxford, only a few years after Tolkien had passed away. It was there that he met the woman who was to become his wife and his closest all-round collaborator, Leonie Richards. After a winding quest through world religions, he converted to Catholicism, a journey you can read about in The Path to Rome, Modern Journeys to the Catholic Church, which has also been published online by the editor, Father Dwight Longenecker, as did Leonie a few years later. He wrote, I dreamed of the Holy Grail, which appeared to me in the living room of my parents' house in Dulwich. The sense of a sacred presence was overwhelming. What this made me realize was how important to me had been the stories I had read in childhood, stories of King Arthur, the Knights of the Round Table, and the quest of the Holy Grail, and later, the Narnia books of C.S. Lewis and The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. All along, my imagination had been built on a Christian foundation, and I had never noticed it before. I knew now that in some sense, on some level, I was already a Christian, I was reading Gilson, Maritain, and Aquinas, finding there a philosophy that made everything I had studied at Oxford look like the work of barbarians. <laughs> this was the 70s, remember. <laughs> it seemed clear to me that most of modern philosophy was the result of a systematic failure to understand, or even to read, what had already been achieved in the Middle Ages. My heart, as they say, burned within me as I read. I suppose this is the normal sensation caused when the mind and the heart start to mingle, when the mind starts to enter the heart and the fragments of a human nature begin to be gathered together in one place. As it was for St. Francis and for Gilbert, the man who went into the cave was not the man who came out again. He looked at the world as differently from other men as if he had come out of that dark hole walking on his hands. Like Chesterton, he was also the English yachtsman who slightly miscalculated his course and discovered England under the impression it was a new island in the South Seas. <laughs> Strat couldn't stand any more of the thin diet he had been fed as a student at Oxford, so instead of pursuing a doctorate, he went into publishing. During a three-month sorry, no, <laughs> three-year stretch living in Boston, Massachusetts in the mid-80s, Leonie and Stratford had their first child, yours truly, and their first proper read of Chesterton. Yes, they had to go to America for that. <laughs> After a reluctant move back to London, my sister Sophie was born, and then following another move back to Oxford, the city of dreaming spires and young dreams, their youngest daughter, Rosemary. Finding inspiration in local luminaries, John Henry Newman and J.R.R. Tolkien, they founded the Center for Faith and Culture and its flagship journal, Second Spring. This is where my father's juggling skills began to come to light. Publications, events, and collaborations were numerous and groundbreaking. From the liturgy conference beyond the prosaic referenced approvingly by then Cardinal Ratzinger, the Imagination Conference, Landscapes with Angels, the papers of which were published in the Chesterton Review, fall winter 2005, to the secret Shakespeare summer school. They were in the thick of the new evangelization. Most modern history, especially in England, wrote Chesterton, suffers from the same imperfection as journalism. At best, it only tells half of the history of Christendom, and that the second half without the first half. 
Men for whom reason begins with the revival of learning, men for whom religion begins with the reformation, can never give a complete account of anything, for they have to start with institutions whose origin they cannot explain or generally even imagine. Just as we hear of the admiral being shot, but have never heard of his being born, so we heard a great deal about the dissolution of the monasteries, but we heard next to nothing about the creation of the monasteries. Now, this sort of history would be hopelessly insuff insufficient, even for an intelligent man who hated the monasteries. As a product of the English education system, I can tell you firsthand, this is as true today as it was a century ago. Taking this problem to heart, the Caldecotts started running historical literary summer schools, which wove together the work of beloved English writers with a sense, with, sorry, with a study of the impacts of the Reformation on England's soul and culture. At a Chesterton conference in London, Strat met the illustrious and hilarious Aidan Mackey, known to many of you. Aidan was looking for a home for his Chesterton library, the most comprehensive collection of Chestertonia in England, and decided to entrust it to Strat and the Centre in 1996, which was, at the time, based at Westminster College. The Centre and the library moved in 1998 to Plater College, an adult education institution created in memory of the great Catholic Social Guild founder, Father Charles Plater. There, Stratford taught a course called Christianity and Society, maintaining the other activities of the center with partial support from external partners. The library moved with the center to its independent office in King Street after Plater's sad closure in 2005, just as Stratford Caldecott was set to launch an internationally con connected MA program in Catholic social teaching there. Like that other convert of whom we are so fond, my father took the name Francis and my mother Claire at confirmation after falling in love with the great saints of Assisi, although it wasn't until later that either one of them, had, uh, either one of them encountered Chesterton St. Francis. Dad would later put it down as one of his desert island books and one of his very favorites of Chesterton's. After reading that text again in preparation for this conference, I was struck by how seamlessly Chestertonian Franciscanism fitted with my father's charism and outlook, though in a quiet, married layman kind of a way. The vision which has been so faintly suggested in these pages, writes Chesterton of the Franciscan spirit, has never been confined to monks or even to friars. It has been an inspiration to innumerable crowds of ordinary married men and women living lives like our own, only entirely different. <laughs> that morning glory which St. Francis spread over earth and sky has lingered as a secret sunshine under a multitude of roofs and in a multitude of rooms. That vision, which so inspired my father and countless others, was, as we all well know, that our religion should be approached not as a thing like a theory, but a thing like a love affair. Near the end of his life, Strat returned to this original patron in earnest, even to the point of requesting that his earthly remains be taken to Assisi should no suitable burial place open up in Oxford. He even ended up wearing a borrowed Franciscan habit at the last conference he ever travelled for in Italy as part of a Radagast the Brown costume. It was his favorite character, the, one, the character he most identified with, which in itself is quite revealing. When his body was laid to rest in a spot that had miraculously opened up close to his beloved Tolkien in Wolvercote Cemetery, my mother added his confirmation name to the headstone, along with a Franciscan tau or cross. In his final book, Not As the World Gives, he reflected, we postpone more radical action or shelve it in order to look after our own family and immediate circle of friends. After all, that is a Christian duty too. But occasionally, it may occur to us to wonder how different the world would be, how much healthier the church, if we acted on our beliefs in the way the saints do, casting away our security and maybe even our friends in order to serve those in desperate need or defend life in some practical way. I took the name Francis at my confirmation 
and was reminded of this at the election in 2013 of Pope Francis, who calls us to live our faith more authentically. In an essay on St. Francis, written in 1984 as a new convert, but included in the appendix of Not As The World Gives, he wrote, the impact of St. Francis on modern society has been immense, if confusingly complex. We never know how our actions will affect the future, how they will be interpreted and what will come of them. All we can do is live in the moment we have been given. Faithful to the spirit, nothing else is our concern. What we see in the case of Francis, the enormous spiritual and cultural energy released into the world by someone who tried to live by the gospel should also teach us that the status quo is more vulnerable than we ever believed, more fragile than its palaces and boardrooms would have us think. In truth, the whole of this fragile world and its history has already been taken over from within and reshaped by a force and a life infinitely more powerful than Francis or all the saints combined. Francis's master, Jesus Christ, has absorbed that world and imprinted on that history the pattern of his own life, death, and resurrection. In this great story still unfolding, Francis has done what, is his, what was his to do. May Christ teach us to do our part. His part, he discerned, was to work towards the re-evangelization of his homeland using every tool he could find. And who better to do it than an amateur academic after all? The English are a nation of amateurs. <laughs> they are even a nation of eccentrics. An Englishman is never more English than when he is considered a lunatic by other Englishmen. Anyone who has spent time at the Oxford Oratory will nod in agreement with uh, Chesterton on that point. <clears throat> but how to reignite the suppressed flame of faith in that green and pleasant land? Perhaps through an anamnesis of a national identity that was rooted in Christ. Strat wrote in The Power of the Ring, his book on Tolkien, Every nation has a legend or set of legends that help to define and enshrine its sense of identity and mission. For Chesterton, whose thought is so close to that of Tolkien in these matters, a national identity is shaped by the interplay of legend with landscape. Countries become beautiful, he thinks, by being loved, by being transformed in love by the imagination of those who live and die there. Those who have lived part have those who have lived, who have become part of the landscape and part of the legend. Graves and monuments are for visiting and the shrine at the end of the pilgrimage provides a meeting place between earth and heaven that sanctifies the whole realm. For romantics such, such as Chesterton and Tolkien, imagination is an organ of perception, not merely a fancy. But sometimes, sorry, end quote there. But sometimes, to fall in love, you need to see the familiar with fresh eyes. Walk with an Englishman through Oxford and you both see the shops, the same old boring 500-year-old buildings, the hordes of tourists. <laughs> but walk with an American and your eyes are lifted up to the intricate stonework infused with stories that go back over a thousand years. To express this mysterious people, Chesterton uh, says in Eugenics and Other Evils, to explain or suggest why they like tall hedges and heavy breakfasts and crooked roads and small gardens with large fences and why they alone among Christians have quite consistently, have kept quite consistently the great Christian glory of the open fireplace. Here would be a strange and stimulating opportunity for any of the artists and words who study the souls of strange peoples. That would be the true way to create a friendship between England and America or between England and anything else. Oh, sorry, perhaps that's not eugenics and other evils. Is that, um, oh, well, anyway, Dale can correct me later. <laughs> um, Chesterton went a long way to doing this himself, of course, and Tolkien either, even further. So Stratford championed them both. As to the success of the mission, I'm not sure we can detangle that yet though on the count of building friendship between England and America, yes, I think we can say he made some progress. 
Stratford Caldecott confused people. Attempting to ride the reeling, reeling chariot of orthodoxy over any of the bandwagons that came his way, he refused to join either the left or the right, resulting in being misunderstood by both camps. His interests were wide-ranging. They did not fit comfortably on a one-page resume. Unless you took the time to really get to know his work and mental landscape, it was hard to see how it all hung together. The human mind is designed to range broadly, liberally, and not be confi confined in a narrow box, he said at the Chesterton Review's 30th dinner, uh, birthday dinner. One time, he came back from an event to report that an American gentleman had waved off his self-introduction with the statement, oh yes, you are that English communist. <laughs> Another time, a critic accused him of writing like a gay vicar, much, <laughs> much to my mother's amusement. <laughs> Even the Chestertonians who, darken, who, sorry, who turned up at the door of the Center for Faith and Culture in Oxford was sometimes stunned to find a wispy elfin gentleman instead of the Gilbertesque, hobbitish figure they had anticipated from his writings. The center he founded, once jokingly described as the center for world domination, was, <laughs> was in fact a fragile perch and constantly under threat. The space itself no longer even exists, having fallen under the sway of Oxford property developers but much of the electronic archives can be found under resources on the Second Spring website. Though physically so different, Strat and Gilbert shared quite a few personal habits. You may have read of Frances Chesterton's battle with her husband's unruly hair in uh, Nancy Brown's marvelous biography of her. It reminded me of my mother's story about Bachelor Strat's solution to hemming his trousers, a stapler. Gilbert forgot to bring a tie to his wedding. Strat forgot to remove the label from his shoes at his wedding on display for all to see as he knelt at the front of the church. <laughs> Both men had a propensity to doodle everywhere, though my father's were usually geometric and symbolic and always confined to notebooks or papers, never in his precious books. He was blessed with a better metabolism than Chesterton, however. At one point, he did earn the, name, the nickname Three Desserts Strat, <laughs> yet he was naturally slender as a rake. He put this down to his unique form of regular exercise, bouncing up and down on his toes while standing. <laughs> but you were much more likely to find Strat up a tree or lying on a sofa reading while small children climbed all over it than smoking a pipe in a gentleman's club in London. The establishment in England really didn't know what to do with him, much as they don't know what to do with Chesterton these days. My mother describes him as intellectually peripatetic and determined to remain free in spirit. His dislike of being penned in was part of his unstinting pursuit of truth, of course, and fed his ability to synthesize and explain complex theological ideas and dialogue with a wide range of people but it also manifested in a professional restlessness, which tended to be at odds with the family's financial security. He had a total inability to tick corporate boxes, and while this could be annoying, it fitted with his jean Cleur personality. As Chesterton said of St. Francis, the jester could be free when the night was rigid, and it was possible to be a jester in the service which is perfect freedom. Those of you who have come hoping for an academic conference are going to be disappointed by this one, Strat announced at the Prophet of Sanity conference in Oxford in 1997, um, or, which he organized with the Chesterton Institute. But he went on, I make no apology on that score. Why should we be bound by the conventions that govern an academic conference? There is something radically wrong with modern academic life and with the way our lives and interests are comp compartmentalized by the education system. I felt that when I was a student in the university down the hill, and I feel it now. England, after all, is, good, is a good place to feel it, for at least we have a distinguish, distinguished tradition of gentlemen and lady amateurs in this country. 
G.K. Chesterton is a good example. He was no Renaissance man, but he was an integrated man of a type all too rare and rarer now than before the Second World War. So do not think of this as an academic conference. Think of it more as a kind of retreat. Prayer and meditation combined with friendship and conversation. We have much to reflect on together, things that concern ourselves and our children. It is a retreat that takes place under the influence of G.K. Chesterton, a man who represents many things. To some of us, he represents the best of a civilization that is passing away. Pater Edmund Waldstein, in a blog post titled, Blessed Are Those That Mourn, wrote that, it would be easy to dismiss Stratford's vision as a sort of romantic Arcadianism, a longing for a past that never really existed in which immortal elves and pipe-smoking hobbits inhabited England. This is the accusation that is always brought against the opponents of capitalism. There was indeed a romantic strain in Strat, and he was deeply devoted to Tolkien, but Strat was far from exaggerating the happiness of past ages. He had no illusions about the difficulty of the task of slow evangelization. Strat's mourning over the destruction of beauty always had an undercurrent of joy because he could, he could really hope for the restoration of all things in Christ. Close quote. Like his patron, St. Francis, and his mentor, Gilbert, Strat was same and with the very sound of the word sanity, as at a deeper chord struck upon a harp, we come back to something that was indeed deeper than everything about him, that seemed almost an almost elvish eccentricity. He was not merely eccentric because he was always turning towards the center and the heart of the maze. He took the queerest and most zigzag shortcuts through the, wo through the wood, but he was always going home. I took his quiet intelligence for granted when I was growing up. I thought everybody's dad left a pile of books with sticky notes outside their bedroom door after they raised a philosophical question over family dinner. <laughs> then I found out that he got a, second, a high second class degree at Oxford despite deliberately answering all the examination questions he hadn't studied for in advance, and that he was essentially a speed reader. Where are those genes when I need them, I still wonder. <laughs> I only inherited his bad eyesight. <clears throat> what was so remarkable, though, as one friend reflected after he died, was his intellectual charity. He never left anyone feeling belittled or dismissed, regardless of whether or not they were his match or in agreement with him. I can talk to anyone, he once told me, as long as they care about truth. If they don't, we don't really have anything to talk about. <clears throat> to be a Jean Cleur, or arguably a good Christian, one does, I believe, need a certain level of comfort with being ridiculous. Though, as his daughter, I was obliged to find his sense of humor somewhat embarrassing. People have told me Strat was very funny. <laughs> I have heard the story of his toast at this very conference in 2005. According to witnesses, he had everyone, including our noble president, in stitches. Mark Shea reported, Stratford's joke was extra super hilarious because his soft-spoken manner combined magnificently with the funny way he simply could not get to the punchline. <laughs> yes, that sounds like dad. I wish I could remember more stories like that myself. Unfortunately, the instances I most vividly recall are not approved for public consumption, <laughs> <laughs> such as his wry and very earthy poems composed in honor of the family dog, <laughs> with whom he had a Mr. Darling-like love-hate relationship, perhaps an instance of his Franciscan charism failing. <clears throat> it's just as well I'm not allowed to share those. I can't get through them without weeping with laughter. <laughs> After he died, the tributes poured in from all corners of the globe, a testament to the widespread friendships and connections forged by his life and work. Um, part of Waldstein wrote, 
that after the Caldecotts left Boston, we saw them only seldom, but their gentleness and nobility helped form the horizons of my memories and those of my brothers and sisters. They were also our paragons of Englishness. Kathy Schiffer of Pathias declared that Strat was a giant in the Catholic world. I had the opportunity to meet him once and hear him speak. His remarks were predictably solid and profound. I was struck by his humility and by the high esteem with which he was regarded by the American Catholic academics. Pierpaolo Fernaldi, man managing editor of the Catholic Truth Society, with whom Strat worked as a commissioning editor, noted his encyclopedic knowledge of the faith. Michael J. Lichens, author, editor, sorry, editor of Catholic Exchange, who had attended one of my parents' summer programs in Oxford years before, told the Catholic News Agency, I don't know anyone who has encountered Stratford Caldecott and not been changed, whether by his writing or meeting him in person. He was the most powerful voice for Catholic culture in the Anglophone world. <coughs> It was only in the last decade of his life that my father turned in earnest to writing, publishing seven major books between 2003 and 2014, the year he lost his battle with cancer. This meant that the books sprang from the mature growth of his ideas. Whenever I dip into them, I find a rare combination of depth and, char and clarity and charity. The topics are diverse, but they flow together, and this is how. The Seven Sacraments, Entering into the Mysteries of God, was the first of two books on mystagogy, the sacramental mysteries of the church, looking at a range of important sevenfold structures in, in uh, scripture and tradition, such as the seven virtues, the seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer, the seven days of creation, and the seven last words from the cross, exploring significant correlations between them and arguing that greater attention should be paid by biblical, biblical scholars to numerical symbolism in the inspired text as a whole. This book was intended to open up an approach to the Catholic faith based on a deeper appreciation of its organic unity and of the sacraments. The second book on mystagogy, all Things Made New, The Mysteries of the World in Christ, explores the mysteries of the Rosary and the Book of Revelation. While the seven sacraments had concentrated on examining patterns of seven, All Things Made New examines the use made of the numbers 12 and 4 by biblical and patristic writers, demonstrating once again the merits of reading scripture and tradition in the light of faith with an eye to the underlying structure. This book reflects, includes reflections on cosmology and liturgy and a meditation on the way of the cross. Beauty for Truth's Sake on the Reenchantment re of Education was the first of two books on the Severan liberal arts. Beauty for Truth's Sake concentrates on the quadrivium, that is, the four, the four cosmological subjects on which classical learning once depended both as a preparation for the study of philosophy and theology and as the basis for an education for intellectual and spiritual freedom. After looking at the classical and medieval tradition, the book traces the way our secular society developed and the problems this has created in present day higher education and the culture at large. It suggests ways in which the arts and the sciences, faith and reason, religion and mathematics could be put back together after a long period of estrangement that has created a civilization both deeply flawed and profoundly dangerous. Beauty in the Word, Rethinking the Foundations of Education, was the second book on the Severan Liberal Arts, and it concerns grammar, logic, and rhetoric, reinterpreted in a way that enables them to be used as the framework for, re for a renewal of the education system, especially at primary level, remembering, thinking, and communicating become the foundations of a curriculum in which all school subjects can be taught in a more integrated manner. These basic human skills develop naturally out of an understanding of our nature as created in the image of God, created for self-gift in the image of the Trinity. 
The book also examines questions related to authority and ethos within the school, and both of these texts have been used for curriculum design by teachers and parents in Britain and the United States, which would have delighted Strat so very much. Originally called Secret Fire, The Power of the Ring, the spiritual vision behind The Lord of the Rings, um, was reissued by Crossroad in an expanded edition in 2012. Unlike most other books published on Tolkien's writing at the time, it explored the spiritual, theological, and philosophical meaning of the work, Tolkien's faith, which was influenced by the oratory of St. Philip Neri, his attempt to recover the spirit of England that has almost been lost in the two world wars, his theology of creation and the importance of the human imagination as a means of apprehending truth, as well as the spiritual aesthetics of virtue. In The Lord of the Rings and his other works, Tolkien was creating a vehicle in which to transmit to future generations the light of a poetic knowledge that is fast dying out and in many places has been entirely forgotten, depriving us of a vital dimension of our humanity. This theme of spiritual light was taken up again in the book The Radiance of Being, Dimensions of Cosmic Christianity, which explores the meaning and implications of the divine trinity as a basis for understanding the cosmos. In other words, it starts where beauty for truth's sake finishes. Beginning the, with the concept of light in modern science and cosmology, the book goes on to explore the relation of science to faith and the questions that arise from the differences between religions and the tensions between religious communities. The uniqueness of Christianity is shown to lie in the incarnation and trinity, but this does not justify aggressive polemics or religious violence. This is his words. The book culminates in an appreciation of the Russian idea of God-manhood and divine wisdom. Not as the world gives the way of creative justice, with, um, with a focus on the nuptial mystery at the heart of the universe, this, this book integrates the social teaching of the church with the spirituality of the Sermon on the Mount. Beginning with Plato's insights into the nature of justice, he explored the history of Christian charity and the meaning of mercy and the virtues, the threats posed to a civilization by modern technology, the true nature of human freedom and of good work, the challenges of the new evangelization, the foundations of the way of beauty, and how to renew a Christian culture. So I, I, what I'm saying is there's a lot in it. <laughs> the, aim of the, book, the aim of the book was to show how the radiance of being can shine through not just the natural, but also the social and, the cultur and cultural worlds. There are many elements of Strat's work I can't go into in depth today, largely due to being underqualified such as his connections to the Communio School of Theology, which, uh, of which he was a self-proclaimed popularizer. And there is certainly some tugging on the threads of the very Franciscan interest he took in ecology and environmental stewardship that could be done, work that, according to a reliable account, fed directly into the encyclical Laudato Si, or his work with Muslim scholars in Oxford and Venice on a joint theology of work project too many wardrobes to explore. But I do want to share with you the conclusion of his final book, with its sweet, lingering flavor of hope so desperately needed in these days dominated by the rise of the machines. If we are indeed creatures of gift, who find ourselves only by striving to love, then our, polit our political and economic structures, our ethics and philosophy have a single goal, Solidarity through communion, the, be the common good of humanity in harmony with nature. The Beatitudes teach us how to be happy, how to find a happiness that the world cannot give. These teachings are not just words, but deeds. In becoming man, assuming our flesh, our human state, God lives these words, these teachings. The word becomes flesh. No man has ever been less of a hypocrite than Jesus of Nazareth. And because no man is alone, but is always constitutively, constitutively related to God and to neighbor, the word has also become human society. We cannot ignore the church or separate Catholic social teaching from the rest of theology. Justice is the key to order, 
but it requires imagination to create a just society and to build a culture of life in which the beauty of God's love shines through, in which every mother is supported, every child protected, every sick person helped, every stranger welcomed. This is creative justice. Man is a microcosm and a fallen, broken one at that. Our ideal city is a dream, a fantasy, until we see it arriving like an impossible resurrection. Plato and the others were right. The soul is the key. The ugly struggle for power, the lies and Hippocratic oh, uh, oh, hypocrisy that are so common in the realm of Caesar can only be defeated by an inner struggle. Nothing is possible without prayer, but with God, all things are indeed possible. A Christian society may seem a long way off, but that is a mistake. It exists already in and among those who show mercy and kindness to those around them. A final thought from you know who in guess which book <laughs> concerning the jongleur, the, je the jester and the gentleman scholar. It is not merely true that these were great men who did great work for the world. It is also true that they were a certain kind of men keeping the spirit and savor of a certain kind of man that we can recognize in them the taste and tang of audacity and simplicity and know them for the sons of St. Francis. Um, if you if you would, um, I, I'd quite like to do a, a prayer. And a few of you may know this one. Um, it's the prayer for England. Um, so if you do know it, please join join with me in saying it. Um, but it may not be so f familiar to you. I'm not sure. O oh, blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God and our most gentle queen and mother, look down in mercy upon England thy dowry and upon all us, all of us who greatly hope and trust in thee. By thee it was that Jesus our savior and our hope was given unto the world. And he has given thee to us that we might hope still more. Plead for us thy children, whom thou didst receive and accept at the foot of the cross, O sorrowful mother. Intercede for our separated brethren that with us in the one true fold they may be united to the supreme shepherd, the vicar of thy son. Pray for us all, dear mother, that by faith fruitful in good works, we may all deserve to see and praise God together with thee in our heavenly home. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we do have some time for uh, questions for, for Tessa, if anybody has them. Uh, there's a mic over here and a mic over here. Go easy, Te go Tessa, easy, go easy on me. <laughs> thank you, that, that was beautiful and um, testament to your dad and, and you are as well. Thank um, you. I speak with metaphysical certainty that everyone in this room would like to hear the poem about the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I haven't got the family's approval. Um, <laughs> but it may be for, maybe maybe it'll be for, forthcoming for his the 10th anniversary or something. I I have to I have to work on it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, I'll leave you're you gonna, all hanging. You're, you're just going to tease like Yes, that. I am. Yes. Uh -huh, that's right. <laughs> I know, so cruel. One day, watch the space. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, what breed was your dog? <laughs> <laughs> he, was a, he was a cocker spaniel, a very, very beautiful and very silly cocker spaniel. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yep, yep. Yeah. Any questions not about dogs? <laughs>
Over here. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wondered if your dad ever consulted any of you about the Caldecott award-winning books that were chosen every year. <laughs> it's not related to our family directly. I believe we're vaguely related to Randolph Caldecott, who was um, who, who it was named for. But yeah, everyone always asks me that. <laughs> I wish. I wish we were part of that. No, we don't have any say in the choice. <laughs> right. Okay. So then I can't ask you what your favorite is. <laughs> I no, no. Sorry. I mean, I have a few of them on my bookshelves, but I, yeah. Tessa, could you share any? I'm over here. Oh, Hello. Sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at the light. Could you share anything about coming to America, what you've seen in America, kind of oh. the experience growing up in England? And, <laughs> well, nothing and that Chesterton didn't say already. <laughs> um, goodness. Yeah. I, I mean, it's funny. I. Everyone always asks me, was it, big, was it a big shock to move over here? Was it very different? Um, but I was around so many Americans growing up that I, it, it feels like a second home. It always has. Um, so, yeah. I think, I think in Oxford I actually had more American friends than English ones. I, just, <laughs> just how it worked out. You guys are quite friendly, generally. So, <laughs> Nothing against the English. I love the English. But... <laughs> My non-dog question is about America, though. You, in your talk, you talked about um, uh, culture in, in a nation being formed by legends. <clears throat> For a younger company, a country like America, mm. that doesn't have the same kind of legends, where do we get our culture from? Mm. Well, I mean, I think it's a combination. There is certainly uh, a kind of American mythology. Um, you know, look at cowboys. There's a kind of pushing out to the West, exploring kind of spirit about you that is certainly wrapped up in a mythology. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, my father also wrote a lot about the other American mythology, which is comic books. Um, I haven't spoken about that today because that's a whole other, whole other thing, but he did see that as a kind of mythos, um, which revealed a lot about American culture and the modern world and the way that we're thinking about things these days. So. Um, yeah, he had a lot to say about that. Uh, so whether or not you like those, th those um, art forms, it, they certainly reveal a lot about us uh, and about where the zeitgeist is and all of that. Um, but the other thing is, of course, you know, America didn't come about from a vacuum. It came about from a whole combination of other mythologies and cultures, which, of course, is why I'm sure it's one of the reasons that Americans are so interested and intrigued by England. Um, or by, you know, Ireland or the other places that their families came from. So all of that weaves together. It's all part of a, you never have, you know, a, a boxed-in identity. You've got all these things um, feeding into you, who you are. Um, yeah. Last question over here. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I spent a little time with your, with your mom and dad in Oxford about 30 years ago, and i um, very grateful for that uh, time. And, and happy to see you this morning. Um, I was very moved by your father's, what, what I think of as a sort of apostolate to the new age. And yes. uh, whatever you could say a, a word or two about that, and if anyone's sort of carrying that on now. Mm, oh, yeah, I'm not sure about carrying it on, but so my, father, um, my father's family were very involved with the new age movement thing. Um, his father was a publisher in that field, um, and very, although he was a kind of agnostic sort of, uh, Marxist-ish sort of fellow. Um, he, he was very intrigued by um, New Age ideas. So uh, my father was exposed to all of that from, from an early age and was just read very widely in all world religions and pagan revivals and spiritualist things. So he, uh, he had a pretty good understanding of it. Um, so he, you know, he wrote a whole booklet on dialoguing with the New Age movement for the Catholic Truth Society. I think it's still in publication. Um, so, uh, you know, he says, he says a lot in that. Um, but yes, he came from such an unorthodox background. You know, he could speak to that um, pretty, pretty well. But I don't know about other work going on um, in that field. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, thank you once again, Tessa. Thank you. Thank you.